Sabine County, Texas, March 31st, 1887. The moonlit pines of a thicket, it's called, a dense forest in East Texas. Suddenly, gun flashes erupt. This is the centerpiece of the explication of the Texas Rangers in Joe Papalardo's new book, Red Sky Morning, the epic true story of Texas Ranger Company F. At this shootout, March 31st, 1887, and we need to tell the story of who's shooting and who the captain and sergeant of Company F are that get hit by the gunfire. Joe, congratulations. It is wonderful to go to Texas because your history of Company F also tells the story of the transformation of Texas into the modern super state that it is. The shooting that night is between Company F led by Captain Scott and Sergeant Brooks and the Connor family. Why are they shoot? Why are the Rangers shooting it out with the Connors? Who are they? What did they do? Good evening to you, Joe. Hello, and thank you so much for having me. The Connor family, an East Texas family of master hunters, backwoodsmen who live and manage to do better than scrape out, but do uh, actually make a very good living out of terrain that most people in Texas don't know what to do with it. Uh, they run hogs, they cut timber. They are masters of their terrain there. And they are, have been swept up into this very violent feud in Sabine County with two other prominent families. And there have been killings and jailbreaks. And now they're on the lamb hiding in their own backyard and the rangers have been assigned to root them out one way or the other, hence this moonlight raid. This is an existential threat to the Connor family. Old man Connor, Willer, Willis Connor, comes from Florida, I believe, and he has a patchy background. Although I learned from you, Joe, everybody in the 19th century carrying a weapon has a patchy background. And they didn't move from Florida to Alabama to Arkansas to Texas because things were going well. So you wind up in Texas that seems to be willing to accept everybody as a start over, a second chance. Is that the flavor of Sabine County entirely as they as they create out of the wilderness this town and this uh, governance? Sabine County to me is very interesting because it lies on a very popular trail into Texas. So almost everyone who was approaching Texas from the east was passing through Sabine County at one point. And it's this very dark foreboding, swampy, you know, the pine trees are so thick and the canopy is so vast that even in the daytime, it's very gloomy. And most people would pass it on by, but people like the Connors who are familiar with that kind of train, they're from Georgia, then they moved to Florida. He gets in a, um, some trouble down there and, and there's a murder rap and he's wanted. Willis Connor is who moves his family to Texas, but not just any part of Texas, a part of Texas that is very much like his his native Georgia. So they know how to use that terrain. And they bring that frontier mentality with them in that they don't want to be messed around with anyone. They want to be left alone to pursue their own sort of destiny. And even the Rangers comment that these men only want their liberty. They're not in it for bank robbery. They're not in it for any kind of political game. They just want to exist in their own little area. They're not cr out committing many crimes past the, the jailbreaking and, and the initial, initial murders of the, of the family feud. But even that was an existential threat to the family, the, the beginnings of that feud. So they're very sympathetic outlaws in that, in that regard. And that is a critical factor for the shootout, March 31st, 1887, because it's never clear to this day, to Joe's exhausting research, that the Connors are guilty of anything but defending themselves from a representative of the Lowe clan and a representative of the Smith clan in the shootout that took place in 1883 with rudimentary uh, forensics of the period. They're nowhere near the chemistry and the analysis that's possible today. But the initial uh, decision is that the young men were gunned down and then executed at close range. And therefore the Connor family is condemned there's an initial trial and one member of the Connor family is condemned to prison and he goes off to Rusk prison. The others are to stand trial when they're broken out of jail and they've been on run. Well, not really run. They've been hiding, not really hiding. They've sort of retreated into the wilderness. Everybody knows where they are, but they're not talking to outsiders. 
So when the Rangers come in, they're seen as, yes, law enforcement, but also as outsiders. This gunfire that starts the scene on March 31st, it is not clear if the Rangers are not successful, whether anybody's going to care about what they were trying to do. This is the Frontier Battalion, and we need to pay attention to the fact that this night, several Rangers are badly wounded. One is killed right out, outright, Joe, my memory. But Brooks is badly wounded. He's the sergeant we're going to follow. His, he loses fingers. Scott, the captain, is badly wounded, unto death if he wasn't so tough. And I believe Rogers, Private Rogers, who's going to be later become a legendary Ranger captain, is badly wounded as well. The gunfire dies down. Willis Connor, old man, he has many sons. The list is so long, I can't be sure this is complete. There's Fred, there's Charlie, there's Leander, there's Alfie, there's William, there's John. They're not all present that night. Willis escapes. So we're going to we're going to leave Willis running into the wilderness for the moment and turn to what we need to know about Sabine County, because a great piece of Joe's very careful history is then and now. Joe, you've been to Sabine County. You've been to the graveyard. Do the people of Sabine still remember this gunfight at Bloody Gulch? Does the graveyard still remember the, uh, the bloody fight? There's a lot of history in Sabine County, and it's literally and figuratively just right under the surface. Um, the, the state dammed, two states actually, dammed the river to create a, a, the Toledo Bend recreational area, basically a sportsman's paradise. And so most of my murder scenes are actually under the water. The pine trees are different, but the attitude there is, is very much the same, very insular not welcoming to outsiders. People from Texas go there and other Texans say, hey, where are y'all from? They're not used to that. You know, no one waves when you when you drive by like in other parts of Texas. It's it's its own peculiar sort of sort of spot. And the history is very much swept under the under the under the carpet for the very pragmatic reason that these families all intermarried. They intermarried before the feud, during the feud, and after the feud. And after the bloody events and the of of the that horrible era, and innocents die, innocents go to, to prison. It's a, a time best left forgotten for the sake of the survivors, some of which are starting new lives as intermarried families. So the history is very, very shadowy. There is no great chronicle of it that's ever been sort of published. Uh, yet there it is. There's still people that go to the Connor graveyard and leave items for the family members there. Um, the, the county has to take care of it and maintain it. The person who maintains that graveyard is actually a descendant of one of the first murder victims of the feud um, who were killed by, by the Connors. And even in, the Connors did kill two people in the woods. It definitely seems that way. Even Willis Connor tells a neighbor a version of events that puts the Connors there. There was a clash. They were there and they didn't really offer great defense in court. So they bear a lot of responsibility for amping up the violence there, yet they're extremely sympathetic in Sabine County. Nonetheless, because of their attitude and because of the way, the horrible way that this feud actually ends. And the Rangers are called in because the, the people of Sabine County cannot resolve this. The Rangers are seen as a way of pressing forward for the law, but the law involves a courtroom scene that you provide that is extremely ambiguous. And in fact, in 20th century law, let alone 21st, I don't believe we have a clear verdict of guilty for that first round of trials that happened. Then the Connors break out of jail. And my understanding is once they do that, the uh, calling in the Rangers is obvious, but calling in the Rangers is not easy to do. What do you have to do? Apply to Governor Ireland to get the Frontier Battalion to come to your county? Is that how it's done? Pretty much, it's that's the best direct appeal to get them there. And it's an admission that you can't handle your county. So you're, you know, as a local politician, you're loath to bring in outsiders. But the men, uh, there's a, the, the town of Hempel is the county seat. And the people in Hempel are a little bit different from the people in the other parts of Sabine County. When they feel threatened, they call the Rangers. The neighbors of the Connors never felt that was necessary. And there's a lot of reasons and threats that, that were issued. And after that jailbreak, 
having this lawless element was a direct challenge to that law and order structure. Yet they felt threatened enough by that Connor family to call in the Rangers. Now, one of those people who was threatened was their former defense attorney. So when you look back on that first initial trial that ended up with the one person who later we, we find out probably wasn't there at the shooting, one of the Connor sons, is the one who gets sent to prison. So that fuels a lot of outrage, even though the Connors did it. The wrong Connor is now in prison. So there's a lot of community outrage, hence the jailbreak. As time goes on and the Connors become more of a, of, of a pain for everyone in the county, and all of a sudden you see people starting to peel off and their support isn't there. And eventually that turns into frontier justice from their neighbors, hunting them down to collect the reward. So the, the deterioration of Sabine County and the Connors' reputation there has a direct bearing on the story because it ends up with them being killed. We go to the other side of the gunfire, the Rangers. Who's Captain Scott? Who's Captain Brooks? That is the story of the Texas Rangers' Red Sky Morning, the epic true story of Texas Ranger Company F. Joe Papalardo is the author. The shootout that takes place in March of 1887 is led by a man named Will Scott. Where does he come from? Why is he such a tough guy? Why is he so good at running a ranger, a ranger company that's about 10 or 11 or 12 men coming and going, but it's disciplined. And uh, Captain Scott sets the tone of everybody, very stoic, hard riding, extremely hard riding, living the life in the wilderness as they move around the state as law enforcement. Uh, his beginning is as a volunteer detective. How so, Joe? Yeah, the, the toughness and the guile you can see from the beginning of his law enforcement career because he's a self-appointed undercover detective. He infiltrates a very infamous, the most infamous gang at the time, the Sam Bass Gang. It was committing a series of very brazen robberies. And outside of Dallas, he decides independently to track them down, infiltrate the gang and turn over information to the Texas Rangers had been hunting them. So he does this all on his own as a very young man, and it works. Uh, he almost gets killed for, for his pains, but it does work. He delivers some information to, to the Rangers, and he becomes a Ranger, and that's how he, he, he earns his, uh, his entrance. That is his style. It's guile backed with deliberate force, and his approach is very feels very modern to me, more modern than I thought. I think Texas Rangers you think they come into town, they know who the bad guys are, and they shoot them, and that's the end of it. But the, it, the very modern feeling use of informants, of undercover officers, intelligence operations, the way that they would set up an ambush versus setting up an arrest to, to get the desired effect. Um, the fact that they're raiding the Connor encampment in the middle of the night feels modern. That's how special operations forces do it. That's how police do it, um, catching them unawares. I, a lot of these things feel very felt very modern, and that Scott, uh, that Scott's approach, the the deliberate use of violence, and when you do use violence, be very overwhelming um, with it. Make sure that the odds are in your favor. He, he's a very he's a tactician. Um, he's also very hard charging, and he's willing to take risks to get the job done because he's under a lot of pressure from the governor and the governor's office and local politicians to get this job done and then move on to the next crisis because the Rangers are always expected to be riding hard and getting results. So you he's make not a, risk averse. He just tries to balance that with intelligence gathering and, and all these other sort of tools at his disposal. You make it very clear throughout the telling of the Texas Ranger Company F that what is also modern about them is that they're on a budget that's constantly being cut back. So they have to do more with less each time. And they're not sure about next year and next year whether they're going to be extended. And the reports that are sent in about their conduct can mean that they're going to be disbanded or, or be trimmed back by the governor in some fashion. So I had to remember this is a political event as well as a law enforcement event. Now about Scott, how he works, you're quite right. His first instinct is to send spies into the region pretending to be what at one point uh, wagon hobos, a couple of a couple of his boys, as you say, it's not hard to convince people they're cowboys because they are cowboys. That's where he recruits them. But um, it all works. However, this is a moment in time, Joe, you make very clear that the climate 
determines a great deal of what's going to happen to the Texas Rangers and to the Texas frontier. The winner of 86-87, if I remember correctly, in other words, the winner right before the shootout is really severe. What does it do to the herds? What does it mean about the Cowboys? Right, the, the idea of the open range was being strangled by barbed wire. And everyone seems to think, well, the barbed wire got set up by local landowners who wanted to, to you know, make sure that they ha had the sole access to water supplies and, and all of this. But <clears throat> what, what I didn't realize before I started researching books, was there was these enormous economic forces that were ending the open range. And it was mostly based on weather. There was horrific blizzards that blew, uh, that drove the herds of open range cattle into drift fences and uh, drift fences were supposed to keep the, the cattle sort of, you know, in, in the right areas, um, you know, especially along state lines. So they'd be pressed up against these, um, these fences or, you know, near railroad lines where people could see them, they were dying by the hundreds of thousands. It was this inhumane crisis and also an economic crisis. The, the amount of cattle loss was, was enormous. They can't sustain losses like that when you can't control your animals, when they're just wandering around everywhere. Plus, there's all the sort of political turmoil that following the herds into Indian territories causes, following the herds across state lines. And there's all these attendant sort of fights over that. So the way to organize all that chaos and to protect the cattle industry and to protect the territorial rights of A, B, and C entities, fencing is the answer. And uh, there's a lot of people who won't accept that, but the, but the Texas state government very much, very much wants to bring that sort of control. And the Texas Rangers are the agents of change. They're, they are bringing the, the barbed wire. They're backing the people who set barbed wire up and, and hunting down the fence cutters and the fence nippers who, get, who go out and cut down the barbed wire as soon as it's set up. And while they're at it, usually steal some cattle. Um, so, so they're part, again, of this political process. And they are the ones who are bringing the change by gunpoint to people who don't want to the open range advocates who do not want it, which include judges, local politicians, local law enforcement. So, again, they're interlopers in these communities. And Captain Scott is meant to enforce a, po a political transition underway that everybody can feel, but they're not quite sure where we're headed. Texas's economy is going to adjust. No more cattle drives to Kansas. We're going to bring the railroad in here. And cowboys are attractive and romantic, but not necessarily employable anymore. We have 30 seconds. Does Scott see all this in his memoirs when he reflects upon it? I, Scott saw it so much so that he, after the Rangers, uh, uh, his stint with the Rangers was building railroads, um, in, especially in Mexico. So yes, uh, uh, very much so. Brooks saw it as well. It was right in front of them. They were able to wander the state and see everything firsthand and process that into their careers later in life. So yeah, they had a very keen eye on, on this political dynamic. We need to go to Brooks because that also tells the story of Texas Ranger Company F, the epic true story, Red Sky Morning, Joe Papalardo, the shootout in March of 1887 in Sabine County includes the severe wounding of the two leaders of the Ranger a unit, a company F, the killing of one, the, uh, the murder of one, who's buried with great mourning by the local people, and the wounding of another, John, of John Rogers, who will become the praying ranger. Uh, he says, uh, he's a severe a Presbyterian who doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, you understand. He's he will become a, a legendary captain in the future. But right now we're following J.A. Brooks because he is the sergeant that night and he will become a legendary captain of the Rangers as well. But a year before in a town called Alex, Brooks is caught up in law enforcement. He's asked to back up an Indian agent who is in town to confront a gunslinger cowboy who's well connected, coming from a wealthy family named St. John. The events of that day very much changed the direction of uh, uh, Sergeant Brooks's life. And it gives him a taste of the other side, which he doesn't like at all, the, the law breaking side. Uh, that day, Joe, let's go to the details because there's an Indian agent. This is Indian territory, I believe, or at the edge of it. 
St. John is a, a, a well understood cowboy, tough guy who carries a weapon where he knows he should not. The Indian agent asks Sergeant Brooks and another ranger to back him up. Why and what happens? Right. The uh, TR Knight is, has run into St. John before and told him he shouldn't wear his gun to town and was in very much insulted. And St. John rides away. Now, Knight didn't even have a, a firearm on at the time, but there, there, there's no respect for Indian agents. They're federal law enforcement officers, but there's the, the inherent racism and their job of trying to police cowboys who are coming in from out of state. It was, you know, that that was conflict that almost seems inevitable, but there's no law that really backs them up. Um, the, the, Indi the federal Indian agents don't, aren't protected by the same sort of laws that protect other law enforcement at that time. So cowboys will shoot at an Indian agent where they wouldn't normally shoot at other law enforcement. So when he sees St. John walking into the store and he's riding with two rangers because they're chasing mule thieves, um, he says, hey, guys, back me up on this one. And so the three of them stride into Red Store and Alex, uh, where St. John is chatting up the, the storekeep and try to take his gun. They say, uh, you know, he puts his hand on his leg and says, I'll take that gun from you, son. St. John starts to fight. And next thing you know, the store is filled with gun smoke. The Rangers have their guns out and St. John is lying dead on the floor. Importantly, Joe makes it clear to me, this is black powder gunfire. Therefore, after the first shot, you can't see anything. You just keep shooting. You hope you can keep shooting. And you're not sure who fires the first shot. It's a, it's a scene that you can relive again and again and again. But clearly our protagonist, Sergeant Brooks, is there to back up an Indian agent going about enforcing public order. However, because of this shootout, all three are charged with murder. And St. John's political connections mean that that murder trial will go forward. So after the shootout in 87, March of 1887, and Brooks recovers without two fingers, and he becomes extremely self-conscious about miss having a maimed hand the rest of his life. Joe provides a picture, and you can see him being very careful about where he puts his hand, so you can't see that he's maimed. But in any event, he is called back in August of 87 to Fort Smith, right, Joe? He's, he's to go to the uh, county seat, to Fort Smith, for a trial run by a very famous trial uh, a judge who is the judge of the of law enforcement in the territory. This is a very popular man, Judge Isaac Charles Parker, the U.S. Court of Western District of Arkansas, and he's known as the Hanging Judge. Now, what's striking to me, the scene you said is wonderful. The trial is compelling, but it's on the second story of a building that used to be an army fort, I believe. Help me, Joe, if I get the details wrong. And underneath are all the rascals all together. And the odor of gangsters all living together and crowded together below comes up through the floorboards into the courtroom. Do I have that right, Joe? Yeah, it's a, it's a dungeon. And uh, there's already a reform effort. By the time Brooks has his trial there, there's a reform effort to clean the place up and build a new one. It's so wretchedly inadequate. So you've got the reformer descriptions of, you know, what it smells like and how many people in the overcrowding. And that's actually borne out by the officials who were also lobbying to have something new built there. So it was a terrible place to be incarcerated um, for any length of time. Most of the time that he and the Rangers and Knight were at the fort, they were in house arrest with the U.S. Marshal. But after the trial, they're sent down below and for someone like Brooks, who found his entire identity after a series of failures early in his life in, in Texas, he became a ranger. Really, he becomes a sergeant. He's a, a man of stature. He's always sort of one mistake away from becoming an outlaw himself in some regards. He was a heavy drinker who you know, couldn't find his way. That's outlaw material. You're one mistake away, usually. So there you go. Now he's relegated to prisoner um, and he's no longer a Texas Ranger because upon conviction, you have to give that up. So it's a nadir for this very famous Ranger in his entire career. This is as bad as it is ever going to get. 
a grace note when he first arrives in town for his trial. He gives us a, a, a vision of Bell Star, and he and he writes about this uh, in his memoirs. Who is Bell Star at the time to Sergeant Brooks? Oh, Bell Star is a, a legend to Brooks as well as pretty much everyone else in Texas and, and a growing swath of the country as well, thanks to to the wires and. Um, Bell Star is the queen of the outlaws. Um, she runs around with horse thieves. Her husbands have a habit of getting shot and killed. There'll be one shot and killed shortly after the, the trial that, that Brooks sees her coming. The thing about Bell Star is that she's extremely stylish. She's got her, you know, she rides side saddle. She comes blowing into town on a big black horse with the U.S. Marshal escorting her. And Brooks loves a woman on a horse. Um, as, as he uh, re reminisces later in life. And, it, and this image sticks with him. She comes into Fort Smith for several trials and always leaves with a not guilty verdict. And uh, you, have a picture, you have a picture of her in your book. It's wonderful. And taken at, this, at the time. That's of the, the day trial. of the trial. The, 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 what Brooks saw and remembered in his memoir, there is a photo from that day of the U.S. Marshal with her side saddle with the the empty gun on her hip, um, but she wore right into town. She looks every bit of the outlaw queen that the press was calling her. And uh, and she beat the rap that time, too. As Brooks is, Brooks is waiting, at, as his, the wheels of justice are turning on him, he sees this, you know, proud outlaw come in and come out again, while him, the proud lawman, seems like uh, he's going to, to be facing a, a very hostile district attorney and a, and a very hostile jury. And he is. And yeah, he's not wrong. The testimony makes it clear that not only is Brooks a murderer, according to the testimony, he's a bushwhacker because they claim that St. John was shot in the back, which may or may not have been accurate. There was nobody behind him. But depending upon, uh, again, it's rudimentary forensics. And the jury comes back with a guilty with a, uh, a verdict of not guilty of murder, but guilty of manslaughter. And Brooks is now taken and incarcerated. And the wheels of politics, Joe, I love this scene because I didn't expect it to come. It turns out the Rangers are well thought of at Fort Smith and letters are written to whom, Joe? The, the letters go straight to the one person who can get the lawmen out of trouble the fastest. And that's the president of the United States, Cleveland. Uh, Grover Cleveland has a, a attorney general who has an entire process to accept pardon uh, applications and ferry them to the executive office. So there's already the machinery and Cleveland will be known as one of the most pardon granting presidents in history. So this is early in his term though, and he doesn't have that reputation. Um, however, it, 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 the letters from, uh, Congress people, Brooks is from Kentucky, so the Kentucky delegates uh, weigh in. Um, there are the Texas state uh, representatives and federal representatives, but mostly the calls come from the Democrats in Texas. And, you know, the, the governor is one of the first Democrats who's been elected um, in Texas. So you need to support your party. So Cleveland's already paying attention from a political sort of standpoint. So he's inclined to give pardons. It's politically expedient, and uh, and he's got politics involving his uh, ideas of what should happen to the Indian territories as well, and backing the federal authority over intruding cattlemen and possible illegal settlers is a good look for him. So the pardon actually goes uh, goes through very quickly, and uh, and he signs it, and the three men are cleared. They're cleared, and this is a transformational time for the Rangers. So. Uh, in fact, December of that year, Scott marries. He's thinking of settling down or life after the Rangers. Uh, Brooks will marry in a few years ahead. So we're going to turn to whatever happened to the Frontier Battalion. The, re the Frontier is closing, certainly in East Texas, perhaps all across West Texas as well. But we're concentrating on the Arkansas, Louisiana, part border Texas, especially the part of Arkansas to Texas. And when we come back, whatever happened to the two legendary captains, Captain Will Scott, Will Scott of Company F, and eventually Captain J.A. Brooks of Company F. Joe Papalardo, the author of Red Sky Morning, the epic true story of Texas Ranger Company F. It's also a story of Texas. I'm John Batchelor. Many anecdotes. We've told none of them. 
but we have concentrated on the gunfire. And the gunfire is what they remember today. Good heavens. These are lawmen. However, whatever happens to them once they leave the frontier, we, I mentioned Captain Scott marries in December of 87. I believe Captain Brooks will marry in not too long after that. Brooks loves a woman on a horse who can shoot and he finds one, Virginia. However, whatever happens to them after they leave the Rangers, let's start with Captain Scott. You've mentioned, Joe, that he starts building a railroad. To where and what does he make of building a railroad? It seems like the same restless life he lived before. Yeah, there, there's this conundrum amongst rangers. When you are, when you become an officer, you can marry uh, at that point. So sergeants and captains can marry. But by the time you're a sergeant and captain, you've wandered the state enough that how do you settle down? Um, you've got a sort of your pick of the best sort of women. I know it sounds kind of crude, but that really uh, comes out when you're doing the research. I mean, Scott marries a 19 year old and, and they're, and they're all well healed. Right. So yeah. And the, the women family, sort of think that the are, rangers are a great catch. The families are very happy to have a ranger. And as a son. absolutely, absolutely. And, and they're, you know, very financially secure and they're, it's usually their youngest, most beautiful daughters, if you believe all the, the newspaper coverage. And, but, the, but the census data doesn't lie. There's, they usually marry extremely young women and from good families. So, um, it, and it matches all the anecdotal evidence of rangers coming into town. And, and instead of your usual sort of crop of farmers um, and ranchers nearby, you've got the, these handsome, dashing men that come in. And that happens even in, in insular Sabine County after the shootout. So, so there is this aura around the rangers at the time, and, and that influences the romantic politics as well, but also the way that they position themselves afterwards. You marry into a good family, you've got some sort of financial security, at least opportunity. But does that match your rootless lifestyle, all that time spent in the saddle? Can you truly settle down and be happy? And for Scott, his solution was building railroads. You are, uh, you know, you're using a lot of those frontier skills to be, you know, commanding men in a large effort in very austere circumstances everything he he's loves and is used to and it gets him in trouble he's building a railroad in mexico when bandits ambush him and his party and he's wound up shot stabbed and scarred and uh once again uh he's a tough sob and, and he survives that encounter as well but that's the kind of environment he puts himself in after he leaves the rangers and i think it's pretty telling uh, his personality, as I understand it, Flinty doesn't do it. He's rock made and they, he doesn't talk much. And Brooks doesn't talk much either. Is that a ranger style? Not to explain yourself, just to show up. It's part of the template. And, and remember that the modern rangers are very much patterned after the four great rangers. Um, and, and that's Brooks and, and Rogers, the two in Company F are, 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 are half of them. And they are greatly influenced by their captain, Captain Scott. So this deliberate, quiet, um, you know, every word should count. Don't swear in front of anybody else. Um, if you do pull, put your guy down, um, but make sure that, you know, be deliberate, but cautious, but bold, always be riding hard. That, you know, that the hat and the stoicism. You know, I had dinner uh, at, a, at a banquet with a, a, a Texas Ranger, active Texas Ranger, and, and his wife were at my table. And we wound up talking. Same guy. Didn't drink in front of any of us. He didn't swear. He told very few stories. The ones he did tell were great, but they were from when he was a counter narcotics officer, not a Ranger. They are guarded. He had the big hat. That is Scott. That's the reflection of Scott through Brooks, through Rogers, onto the present day. So absolutely, yes. Um, you know, the Company F headquarters is right behind the Hall of Fame Museum. And uh, they know who Brooks is. They know who Rogers is. This isn't, you know, distant history for them. This is a template for them to follow even now. The four great rangers remembered in Waco are uh, Jay, Jay Brooks, John Rogers, the, the praying ranger, uh, John Hughes and Bill McDonald. So we're telling the story of 50 percent of them. The frontier is closing and Scott has left the rangers. He will die in 1913, probably of a stroke, probably of a heart attack, die young compared to where how we live today. Brooks will live a full life, however. He sees the moment when the frontier battalions end and there's a new budget from Austin 
and they only have four ranger companies left. So the, the detail about the budget and Brooks's life, does he become disheartened because he'll leave the rangers in 04? Or as you say, 21 years as a ranger is enough. Why does he leave the rangers, Brooks? I think that Brooks left the rangers mostly because he needed to settle down with his family somewhere. And he felt always that there was part of being an adult was marrying and moving on to something else, which is what Scott did. Um, so I think that he loved being a ranger. He was always called captain, even after he became a state representative and a county judge. You know, his grave, you know, says captain. That was his identity through his entire life. And I think he missed it. I don't think he ever got disheartened by it. I think he saw an opportunity in South Texas that he couldn't turn his back on and he had to act on it and he couldn't be a ranger at the same time. He put his toe into it when he bought property in what is now Brooks County um, and, uh, and found political allies there and a cause sort of worth fighting for, which is sort of liberating this county from the, the political apparatus that controlled it very unfairly. Um, in my opinion, and certainly in Brooks's opinion. So, so he, had, he, he found a cause to rally behind because he's a fighter. But after he wins that fight and he gets elected to the state uh, legislature and carves out a new county, which they name after him, he becomes a county judge, but now he's settled down. And that's when the alcoholism really sets in and sort of this you know, grinding existence starts to manifest and he disappears for long you know, lengths of time and his life sort of, sort of starts sliding a little bit downhill at that point. His, his children become very um, concerned and despairing. His wife dies. And he's the lonely old man outside of town who happens to be the you know, highly respected county judge and, uh, and legendary lawman. But from a day-to-day -day existence, it, it, it strikes me as a very lonely sort of backside of, of his life. While he is you know, venerated and respected in, in the county name for him, personally, Part of him is still riding the trail and, uh, and missing it. He dies in January 44. Detail. When he gets to the state legislature, this is in the new state house in Austin, built with convict labor, some of whom were the Connors while they were in Russ prison. Wonderful detail. Joe's got all these footnotes. Read the footnotes because Joe goes, goes in other directions of the footnotes and he introduces material you can't con control in a black powder story. So one of the details is when he arrives, the speaker of the legislature, a uh, Democrat, is named Sam Rayburn. I thought, my goodness, <laughs> Sam Rayburn, he's the godfather of Lyndon Baines Johnson. And I told Joe immediately the story of uh, Vice President Truman before Roosevelt's death, going down in the afternoon in Congress to what was called the Board of Education, which was Sam Rayburn getting out a bourbon bottle. And they'd sit around and tell stories. And I can imagine, Joe, they told stories that included the Texas Rangers. We have 30 seconds. There's more to tell about the Rangers. This is just one company. Is that correct, Joe? Is that what you've discovered? Yeah, I think, I mean, this is a particularly interesting company because of the legendary Rangers who were part of it. And just the, the not only the number of shootouts, but the different circumstances within those two years that the individuals and the company found themselves. But the entire organization during that time is learning how to be a law enforcement agency. For the first time, the Frontier Battalion is the first one who had to do that. So when the Rangers sort of lose their way in the Mexican, uh, during the Mexican Revolution and have to reach back into their history for a better version of themselves, the outlaw hunters, there's Brooks and Rogers and their, their shadows. Are, you know, they're, they're the ones that, uh, that, that the rest of the Rangers are patterned off of then and now. The book is Red Sky Morning, Texas Ranger Company F, The Epic True Story. Joe Papalardo is the author. This is CBSI on the World. I'm John Batchelor.